All right, hello once again, Jeff Scott of Rankin Technical College, going through a series of video presentations for the Rankin Technical College AWD Application and Web Development 1111.NET Framework with Web Databases class. The textbook for the class is ASP.NET MVC with Entity Framework and CSS by Lee Naylor. We are about to start Chapter 17 of the book. Chapter 17, as it says, we're going to restyle the navigation bar by using advanced features of CSS. Now, among the things that are talked about in here are positioning, and they talk about the different types of positioning that can be used. I can't say too much. I've said it before that if you're very confused on this stuff, then I would strongly recommend that if you're going to do that and, and start working with that stuff, so to speak, that you go out to w, w3schools.com slash CSS, and that'll be the CSS tutorial. You'll notice if you look very quickly in here, there's the box model that we've talked about. All right? There's other things in here, but somewhere in here, there's position. So let's just very quickly look at this. The position property specifies the type of positioning method used for an element. There are five possible values. The first is static, which is the default. An element with static positioning is not positioned in any way, any special way. It basically goes with the flow. All right. So they show an example right here. Here's static positioning. <clears throat> there it is. It's positioned according to the normal flow of the page. Second is relative positioning. We've got static, relative, fixed, absolute, and sticky. So the second is relative positioning. With relative positioning, as it says, the element is positioned relative to its normal position. Setting the top left, top, bottom, right, or left properties of a relatively positioned element cause it to be adjusted away from its normal position. So notice now we've got 30 pixels left. And if we look at that, there's the 30 pixels to the left. So if we compare that one with this one, you notice here there's just whatever default margin gets put in by the browser, and here we've got a lot more put in. <clears throat> position fixed. An element with a fixed position is positioned relative to the viewport. The viewport basically is the medium that's being used. This means it always stays in the same place even if the page is scrolled. Again, the top, bottom, right, and left properties are used to position the element. A fixed element does not leave a gap in the page where it would normally be located. It says, notice the fixed element in the lower right corner of the page. Here is the CSS that was used. There it is. All right. An element with position fixed is positioned relative to the viewport. All right. Meaning it always stays in the same place even if the page is scrolled. So the idea is that won't move. Next, we have absolute positioning. That's position relative to the nearest position ancestor, as opposed to being positioned relative to the viewport, as we just looked at with fixed. If an absolute position element has no ancestors, ancestors it uses the document uh, body and it moves along with a page that's being scrolled. All right. So there's relative and there's absolute. Finally, sticky. An element with position sticky is based on the user's scroll position. A sticky element toggles between relative and fixed depending on the scroll position. It is relative until a given offset is met in the viewport. Then it sticks in place. It says try to scroll inside this frame 
to understand how this works. See that? Internet Explorer, Edge 15, and earlier versions do not support sticky positioning. So these are CSS3 things that we're talking about in this chapter. All right. I am going to close this, and I'm going to come in and open up the one for Chapter 18. So let's take a look at the end product in here once this comes up. Now again, I believe I'm probably still going to get these error messages when I run this. I'm not going to touch that right now. I know what that's doing, but that's something I believe we cover in Chapter 18. So let's go to Views. Let's just go to the home page, and let's grab Index, and let's view it in the browser. Again, we keep getting the error message, so I'm going to tell it to run anyway. That's not good. Okay, that's going to be the one in here. We have to make some change some settings in here that I don't want to get into until chapter 18. All right. So let's use the book as our basis for what we're doing in here. All right. So far, we have not added any specific styles to the nav bar. It is currently a vertical list with a search box and buttons. So in other words, it looks like this. As with previous chapters, we are going to stick with the default HTML generated by the MVC framework for use with boots, Bootstrap and base the styles around this. The HTML that generates the navigation bar is shown below. The author has highlighted the CSS classes that will be used here. It says we'll be using a lot, but don't worry. They'll break it down. Okay. So this is the nav bar. Nav bar always needs to have the navbar class. Inverse here means that rather than having, um, I believe the inverse says that rather than having a menu bar that's light with dark text, it'll be dark with light text. Navbar static top means even as you scroll, keep the navigation bar on the top. All right. We've got a container class here. Here's our navigation bar header. This is the brand that could be a logo or something else. You can see the various other stuff that's in here. The first style we want to add will style the whole navigation bar to give it a background and rounded corner so it looks more similar to the footer. And there you see the rounded corners. Again, that's achieved through the border radius. We've given it a background color of deep sky blue. We've given it a top margin up here, a bottom margin down here, and no padding on the on the uh, top and bottom, five pixels on the left and right. <clears throat> well, one thing that you see is this displays vertically, and we want to change the display to horizontal. Not tough, all right? We're going to have it float left, the nav and the nav bar. Okay. Now, does that look better? Of course not. We'll still have some work. And the author says that this issue is going to occur. The reason we have this problem is once you float something left, everything is floated left. All right. So we can tell it after you finish the nav bar, clear your display. All right. And that's going to do this. You still might have your own thoughts as to whether or not it looks better or worse. All the content is contained inside of it, and it's floated next to the, the one another. You'll notice it's gotten a lot smaller than it was before. Some of the items, however, are still stacked on top of one another. So we need to add yet more styles to lay out the list elements in a horizontal way. 
So we come in here with a display inline block. And again, hopefully you're noticing when we looked at the difference between here and here, it's looking better and better. But it still looks squashed together. So let's add some padding in between all of the list elements. And we'll update the navbar heading style to add five pixels of padding there also. Now again, you may argue here and say, I understand what you're doing. The problem that I see with this is that when you look at it, it still looks kind of squashed. Well, for lack of better words, then you have a few different things that you can do. All right. You can decide, for example, yeah, there are too many things there, so you can get rid of some of them. That would be one thing that you could do. All right, so you could get rid of some of these. Or you could say that you only want a certain number per line and put this on more than one line. Now, the way the author has decided to move things in here is to move elements using positioning. Now, I just showed you that, but let's take a look at what the author says here. We're going to spruce up the navigation bar and use the large margin added above it earlier in the chapter. To start with, we're going to move the search box and button using CSS so it appears in the margin above the rest of the bar. You oftentimes see that on the website. To achieve this, we're going to use CSS positioning, which allows an element to change position. Elements can be positioned using relative or absolute position or a combination of both. Again, this is the author's take on this. And I'm not saying that what I just went over is better or worse, and you know, et cetera. It's not a competition. As they say, okay? So absolute positioning sets a fixed position of an element in the page. It's completely removed from the page flow. Relative position moves an element relative to its normal position in the page flow. When you use relative positioning, the space taken up will remain in the page flow. Elements positioned using relative positioning tend not to move smoothly as a page resizes. Rather, they appear to jump from page, you know, jump around on the page. Fixed positioning locks an element into a fixed position. So even if the user scrolls, the element always stays in the same position on the screen. I already mentioned that with the navigation bar. Finally, by declaring a parent element as relative and a child element as absolute, it's possible to position the child element relative to the parent. When you use this kind of positioning, the space occupied by the repositioned element is removed from the page flow. This can be used to move smoothly as the page resizes. So, as the author says, they're going to use a combination of relative and absolute positioning. So, now we've got the search. It says we can take the search box and button and move it up and out of the navigation bar. So it's down, you know. And again, it can still be, re still be moved someplace else. But notice the other thing now, too, is we have a little bit more room now. We could add more padding or whatever. So the author says here, declaring the div with the nav bar collapsed is having a relative position allows any child elements to be positioned, positioned relative to it. Make the search box and button larger by adding padding and spacing out the width. Now use the relative and absolute positioning technique again to move the MVC baby store link all right, out of the div with the class nav bar header as shown right here with position relative. There's our heading. It's now out of the area in here. Says we are now going to restyle the baby store text to make it look more like a branding logo using some different effects. Well, 2.5 M's is going to make that what? Like 40 pixels. So that's going to look a lot bigger. It'll be bolded and it'll have no underline. All right. 
Next, we come in and we start to add some more animated looking features, such as a shadow, a text shadow. All right. Now, they talk about in here, it says <clears throat> the property has four different attributes for horizontal and vertical. A value for the amount of blur applied to the text and a color value of the shadow. If the blur is set to zero, a very sharp shadow appears, whereas setting it to a value like 10 pixels creates a lightly blurred shadow. We're going to add a medium gray shadow, the bottom and right, like this. So you can see the shadow that's been put in here. So look at what's been done so far. All of this stuff that you see right here at the beginning of the chapter was all in there as <clears throat> part of this sky blue div that was at first uh, vertical on the screen, then horizontal. Now we've moved these two things out. Styling letters and lines of text using CSS. Well, we want to take that first line, the MVC, and make it blue. Okay. The other thing, too, is notice these baby and store are each on their, their own lines when we make it a little wider and spread it out. Again, you may have your own thoughts as to whether what the author is doing here is making this look better or making it look worse. All right? This is always in many ways, as I mentioned to you before, for lack of better words, it's kind of a crapshoot in that what I think looks good and what you think looks good may be two different things. They've done some work with the letter spacing here, so this is spaced out a little bit. And personally, I think they're making it look a lot nicer. All right. What's missing here is this image where we actually have a baby's picture right there. So this adding images here on page 547. Throughout the book, we have used the image tag to display images. However, images can also be displayed using CSS. In fact, an advantage that you get of using CSS to display and, and put you know, your, your attributes for your image is you can put things not only position, but in your CSS, you can add your height and width. So what you're doing there is, again, by putting that in your CSS, you're taking that information out of the HTML. So you are abiding by that separation of concerns property that we've talked about previously. So we put in the background image of our baby logo, and right there it is right there. The only problem, so to speak, with this as it currently exists is that by default, an image, if it has room, it's greedy. It'll take up as much room as it possibly can. So we don't want this to repeat. All right, We want a no repeat in there, which means only show the image once, which makes this look a lot nicer than it did previously. All right. at, a, at the moment, it says the baby image is obscured behind the MVC baby store text, making both elements difficult to see. CSS allows you to position background elements by using the background position property, which takes horizontal and vertical values. So we're telling it background position right. Notice what happens then. All right, we take the image itself and we push it off so that it literally does, it is now on the right. All right, this is about 20 minutes in, so I'm going to stop right here and I'm going to finish up the lecture in the next, or finish up the chapter in the next lecture.